conversation, I welcome it. Um, so we're going to start first talking about how homes burn and then um, you know, really focusing in on the vulnerabilities in the house. Uh, I'm not the brains behind this operation. Uh, I have a great colleague, Dr. Steve Quarles, who worked with the University of California for many years in this field, then went on to the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, is now retired from there and is back with us. So this is very empirical based, uh, very evidence based, um, and we have some great information for you together. The fire that you've been preparing for is maybe not the fire to prepare for, but you don't know what, what kind of fire you're going to get. And so let's talk a little bit about the kinds of exposures that you're likely to experience in your home and your home environment. Most of us, I think, have been focused on this idea that there's going to be a flame front that's going to come at my house that might be 100 feet tall, it might be 10 feet tall, it might be one foot tall, but it's going to you know, expose my house to a high degree of heat and direct flame contact. That is the type of fire that most firefighters are actually able to respond to and be able to manage. The more difficult challenges are when your neighbor's house catches on fire and the amount of heat from your neighbor's house catching on fire overwhelms your condition. So the survival of your neighbor's house may affect your survival more than you have planned for. And you all have, if you've had a wood stove, you've maybe tried to dry your socks or your shoes by, by the stove and at some point it steams and then at some point it smokes and you understand that you can get quite a bit of heat coming off uh, a, uh, an object that has combustion going on it. The more challenging situation and the one where we experience the greatest amount of home loss is with embers or firebrands. And embers are burning bits of vegetation, burning bits of homes, material, lawn furniture that get picked up in the air columns and thrown at your house and finding all the little nooks and crannies and all the little weak places. And so we're able to answer questions about this because of this research facility in South Carolina uh, at the Insurance Institute where whole buildings are constructed and then they're exposed to embers in a very empirical way to be able to digest how one product compares to another product and be able to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of different products, which is pretty cool. But it's fairly accurate to what an actual exposure might look like. So here's an illustration from Paradise and you can see just being bombarded by little bits of material uh, enough that uh, there's always a place that they can find some weakness. Now it's similar in some ways to like hail, except for that it may be blowing horizontally instead of coming down from the sky. Uh, it can move with a lot of intensity, um, a lot of uh, success in finding those weak places. And as a result of that, you may see situations like this one in South Lake Tahoe at the Angora fire where the vegetation really doesn't engage. You would think that there was a wall of flame that came and burnt that house down. But really, do you see any evidence of that? No. What happens is that the homes are really becoming the most combustible part of the landscape. And there are weaknesses in each of our homes. And when those embers come flying, they find those weaknesses. And so you can lose, lose your house, not from direct flame contact, but from those embers. So how do we become more prepared for that situation? So I'm going to try and talk that through and illustrate with photos and images about what this looks like. Here's one from Fountain Grove from Santa Rosa where again you see a lot of green left. Uh, where you see brown tends to relate to where the homes caught on fire and, and created enough heat to singe the vegetation around it more than it was uh, the landscape conducting to, to the individual homes. Looking at this image, would you think that it had appropriate defensible space? Yeah, what happened? Embers, probably, probably, yeah. But that green lawn was not sufficient to withstand an ember attack, was it? No. So this is a new challenge, isn't it? It's a new way to think about it. Just because you might be surrounded by a lot of cement may not be sufficient to be able to handle the kind of exposure that your house may experience, or a green lawn, or any other thing. But these are achievable items. There are things that we can do that will make a difference. But what I want to frame for you is this idea is that it's not the problem that's over there. It's not at state parks. It's not at your neighbor's house. It's at your house. These are things that you can do. And we've spent a lot of time talking about what everybody else can do and not so much about what we can do. Uh, let, me, let me just reframe this here. 
when I talk to folks about defensible face, they're usually like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna prune and I'm gonna trim, but by the time I get back to my house, it's safe. It's in my curtilage zone. But these fires are illustrating to us that that isn't necessarily true. And what I'd like you to think about is being able to orient from your front porch outward. What do you see immediately outside your front door? What is fuel there and what can you manage? And then work your way out towards that 100 foot zone. I'm not saying that it, all of it isn't important, but if you can help try and prioritize what's right around your house, for these ember fires, this is gonna be a new framework. Uh, so we're fussing around at the state level trying to talk about whether these are zone one, two, three, or whether we're gonna do zone zero and one and two, and so you'll see some, some change in vocabulary, but there is, strong, there is strong emphasis about really becoming much more aware about what's right around our house. It's not about them, it's about you. What can you control, what can you do front and center so that when these guys pull in, they know that it's safe for their crews to be here and that this is a house worth investing in. In those critical decisions, you wanna be a winner. <laughs> you wanna be a house that someone is gonna put the time and effort in. Because otherwise, it's not gonna happen. There's too many, there's not, it's not possible in these big fires to put an engine in every house. And we can't solve all our problems with engines and firefighters. We can do things about this in our own territory that make a difference. If you've got a canyon coming at you, you have particular vulnerabilities. So you need to think carefully about your house. And so we'll talk about that in a bit. Make sense? Okay. So what are we doing with this California aesthetic? Right? We have to anchor our house to the vegetation. We're afraid to look at our foundations. Aren't we? Right? I mean, it doesn't look lived in if you can't, like, kind of cover that up or something. Right? How do we change that mindset? Thank you, Sunset Magazine, for giving us 100 years of what that's supposed to look like. I think you can achieve beauty, landscaping, and fire safety by just rethinking this a little bit. Pulling that vegetation a little bit out from the house, putting the walkways a little closer to the house, flip-flopping those, and getting our vegetation out from underneath our eaves. Okay? So I use the term non-combustible zone. CAL FIRE is sort of interested in an ember uh, resistant zone. Um, regardless of what term we use, it has to be effective on all sides of our house. Right, any one corner left uh, is weak because these embers are gonna come from lots of different directions, not just one direction. So in this case, we've got a nice non-combustible zone on the back side of the house, but the front side of the house looks pretty different, doesn't it? But it's beautiful. But can we achieve beauty and create fire safety? Yeah, we can do this. Okay, I already gave you a little wrap on the fire resistant plant list. Um, there is no plant list. And if someone's trying to tell you that there is a plant list, take a moment, step back. Think about that plant and how you're gonna maintain it. It's about maintenance more than it is about the plant itself. And it's also, you know, it's a little bit about the structure and, you know, whether it's, it's you know, coniferous and got lots of resin in it. But I mean, you know, here's an illustration. That's cactus that burned, burned in Santa Rosa. Native plants, drought tolerant plants can be good but they also have to be maintained. They can get quite woody, right? There is no silver bullet on the plant list. I love plants. I love, to, you know, I love beauty. And I think it's possible to incorporate all this together. But think about, you know, lavender. Year one, supple, lush and green. Year two, starting to fight back, isn't it? Year three, you stick your clippers in there and you're like shredding your knuckles, right? It's getting really woody. So a plant can change in condition through time. Mulch, mulch also equally important. Why do we use mulch? Keep the weeds down, that's right. Why else? To conserve water, absolutely. But the placement of where we use mulch may make a difference. We might wanna use rock mulch when we're right next, nearer and closer to the house and then use our native materials when we're a little farther away from the house, for example. These will all combust, even the rubber stuff, even some of those other, other weird products out there. 
basically what I'm trying to get you to think about is where placement matters, where the weak points are in the house, you know, where you can create a bunch of heat which will either damage that window or enter in those vents, uh, where you might get uh, eddies of air current. So, you know, if you have a place where all the leaves collect and you see them swirling outside your deck, outside your porch, I sweep my porch almost every day. I get these little bits of material. That's just where the embers are going to go. They follow those same kind of air currents. So these inside corners, particularly vulnerable. Uh, if you have an attached deck, that needs to be part of having a non-combustible zone under and around it. So certainly you can have vegetation, but think about where it is and how it affects your vulnerability. Hardscape, great stuff. Weed whacked. Low grass, not bad. Green grass, not bad. The point is to separate the vegetation from the house. It'll make managing your house so much easier. It'll make painting so much better. It'll re reduce pests, potential intrusions into your house. It will preserve your siding. It'll do lots of great things in addition to providing fire safety. I gave a presentation to some of the master gardeners in Mendocino County and um, the, the lady I was working with uh, went home and realized that she was feeling a little less comfortable about how she had landscaped her place. Here's her before kitchen, uh, before picture. Here's her in progress. I haven't seen the final one where she's really trying to rethink what this looks like. I think that probably bothers some of you in this room. It feels a little naked, doesn't it? What about a little paint job right there to make it so those, those vents don't sh uh, sand out so much? What about a nice sculpture that hangs out in that inside corner? Are there other ways to find beauty in that immediate zone? What about a raised planter bed here so that when you drive up to the house, you see the vegetation and you get that sense of anchoring, but it's not physically touching the house? Thoughts? I don't, I don't, have, the, I don't have the answer for this. It's going to be different in every one situation, but I think it's possible. This year I went to visit Governor Brown and got to look at his house. He already has designed with this non-combustible zone. So he's working on this stuff as well. Uh, and we identified a number of places where he could make some additional improvements. Uh, so the governor can do it. You guys can do it. All right. What should we do in this situation here? Move. <laughs> what do you think the issues are? Maintenance, yeah, maybe no maintenance. I'm going to assume that this is wood decking, wood steps. I don't know. The plants are right up against the house. They're over the roof. They're probably filling the gutters. You want to get a weed whacker out? Yeah, right? Cut some of that stuff down. Move some of it away. OK, let's dig into the house. Everybody doing OK? All right, so I told you a little bit about this lab where we get to do cool things, and or Steve gets to do cool things. Um, and these buildings are instrumented so you can start to see what happens and how they fail. Uh, this is an illustration of two side-by-side -side images from inside the, um, that'd be great. Uh, or maybe it's, no, it's all right. In, inside the house already. Uh, this is a gable invent. This is about the horizon line just for perspective, and you can see these little bits of, Flashes, those are embers penetrating the screens and coming in. This is a side view looking at the under eave vents. Again, you can see those embers coming in. What do you guys store in your attic? Everything, right? I store my children's artwork. Can't figure out where to put that. Mostly on paper. Someone asked me at the last class if it was all sculpture. No, no. So if you have penetration and you have a receptive fuel bed, what do you have? You have fire inside your house. Your house is burning from the inside out. It's really hard to manage that issue. Okay, so that's vents. We also have situations where you've got a complex roof. In this case, you have a dormer and you've got a roof that is probably of hopefully class A standard and next to that roof you have a wall that you're suddenly asking to have the same class A standard. Does it have the same class A standard? Probably not. Not unless you really thought about this. Is this something you can retrofit and change? Very much so. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can see when you have 
vegetation collection, you know, pretty easy to see needles and leaves and material, and it anchors right there, and then all of a sudden you've got embers igniting that material, and then exposure to that wall unit, which is not designed to take heat, then you have a problem. You can also have rain gutters. Rain gutters are super important. We'll talk about those in a minute, but those rain gutters can be filled with material, and that material can catch on fire and go underneath your roofing and wick the flame underneath your roofing. Also, you can have fence-to-house contact, other ways to bring fire directly to your house. Are these manageable items? Yes, every one of them are manageable items, and every one of them are not expensive. So let's go into it. The first question is, where do you start? And so I'm just going to illustrate. You'll see this in, uh, come again. Your most important piece is really the roof and the condition of your roof and the edge of your roof. And then follow that with the vents. These are the types of these are the places where you're going to see exposure from embers that can come along from a long distance away. In priority list, I really think about all three of these kind of working side by side and coupled together. After you've taken care of this stuff, then we get to work on the more finer details of the windows, the deck, the siding, and we get to think a little bit more about what kinds of exposures we're likely to see and whether there's a home or a building that's close to our house. And these priorities begin to shift a little bit more if you've got a fuel in some kind of outbuilding or a house that's nearby that may um, create a lot of radiant heat or direct, direct exposure to your house. So let's uh, dig into some of this. I've got a um, handout, which I'm just going to show you here just for a second. Um, you want to pass? That would be great. I don't want you to spend a lot of time looking at this right now. I just want you to know that we are going to try and work through managing these issues and making decisions and where to start. Uh, and on the back is a um, sheet that you can fill in actions that might make sense for you in your situation. I will define a Class A roof or let Rob define a Class A roof. Class A roof. Basically. Uh, fire resistive material and it's uh, rated by like uh, UL Underwriters Laboratory and ASTM. Um, all the material itself has to have um, that UL, the code on it to say that it's class A. So basically fire resistant. You don't want anything that isn't a class A roof. Your class A roof may be assembly rated so it may not just be the overall material, the exterior of it. It may be the, the components that go into the design and installation of it. So your contractor should understand that. If they don't, then you might want to find a new contractor. Uh, in my case, I have a wood shake roof that's going to be replaced on Monday. It's not rated, right? It's a problem. <laughs> and with the, the 2019 California Fire Code in the WUI or Wildland Urban Interface, it is required now that all building materials for new construction or replacement on a remodel be fire resistant. And so again, the contractor will be aware of what those materials are. But they do have a UL stamp or mm -hmm. STM stamp on mm -hmm. them since they are class A rated. Mm -hmm. So we'll go through this in more detail. I just want you to know that this could feel overwhelming for a minute, and there's a way and a pathway through it. There's a logic model to go through this stuff. Okay? So roof, number one priority. Why is the roof the number one priority? Gravity? What do you mean? Stuff falls on it, right? It's also the largest part of your house. It takes the most exposure. It's resisting the hail, the rain, the embers, the sun, the wind. It needs to be in good shape because it gets the most exposure. Also tends to be the place we put the most penetrations in it. We've got skylights. We've got vents. We might have a complex roof with dormers or intersecting roof planes that come together. So understanding the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our roof really matters. Anyone have a tile roof here? It's common in Spanish style architecture. No? Well, if you have a friend that does, let me just sort of show some of the issues. So beautiful terracotta tiles, definitely class A standard, but it's dependent on these what are called bird stops. I think it's a great name. The idea is you want to keep birds from nesting inside those, those terracotta tiles. Uh, this roof is actually being installed uh, when we took this picture, so it wasn't a maintenance issue. But you can imagine how material can get underneath there, birds' nests, uh, little bits of leaf material, as well as embers. And all of a sudden, you've got penetration underneath that beautiful Class A roof. 
So maintenance of these places really matters. Uh, here's a different style of um, a tile roof. You see that little gap right there? That gap can be penetrated by embers very easily. All this stuff matters. Being aware of the condition of your roof, checking the condition of your roof, maintaining the condition of your roof is important. Question. Does a shingle roof have a similar issue at the peak ridge? Does a shingle roof, you mean like a, a composition tile shingle roof? Uh, yes and no. It depends on how it's designed, whether you've got uh, a uh, vent system up on the top there. So let's, we'll, we'll, I'll show you some images of that. A complex roof, um, I don't have the best picture here in this. Uh, here's you know, two intersecting roof planes. Here you've got a wall that needs to function like a roof in terms of its fire resistance. Uh, is this something that you can manage in either of these situations? Yes. And uh, point number two, you'll see some examples of how we increase the, the one hour fire rating of, those, of that wall. Uh, with some assembly, uh, you can actually do quite a bit there to make a difference. Let's talk about gutters for a minute. Anyone have plastic gutters? Anyone know if they have plastic gutters? Copper. Probably. No, copper, okay. Plastic gutters are not all that bad. They're kind of interesting in this situation. So here, again, is from, from the lab, and we've got a plastic gutter here and a metal gutter here. So the plastic gutter is filled with uh, leaf material, as is the metal gutter. Uh, the leaf material combusts, and the plastic gets hot, and it melts. And then what happens? It falls off. And so then it shifts and creates a new exposure, doesn't it? Right? It moves the exposure from the roof edge now to the siding, and depending on what it lands on, could create another set of issues. In and of themselves, not necessarily so bad, but uh, the comparison would be to the metal gutter, which is going to stay there and hold on tight until all that material is burned away. And you hope that it hasn't wicked flame underneath the edge of your roof. And the way you solve that is uh, with a metal drip edge, which is required by code. But if you have an older roof, you may not have one. And I'm going to illustrate with my hand here. Can't hold two things at once. But you have roof decking. You put a piece of flashing, an L-shaped piece of flashing at the edge of the roof decking. Then, I mean, uh, and then you put the roofing material on. It comes out over. You attach the gutter right like this, so the roof pours off into the gutter. Gutter might be filled with material. It catches on fire. If you don't have that piece of L flashing, you suddenly have your roof edge exposed, and that fire here can just wick right underneath the edge of your roof. So a very cheap piece of flashing makes a huge difference in how your roof performs. That's the roof edge. Now, in our last class, someone said that they just had a new roof installed and they didn't have metal flashing on that, that metal drip edge. I would be very surprised if that has occurred and it was not an inspected situation. But if it is to occur, call your roofer back. It's not okay. You need, you need that little detail edge. It makes, it makes a big difference. Uh, here's an illustration from the campfire, I mean, sorry, the car fire in Reading. Um, Okay, we've got stucco construction, we've got a metal roof. You think you've got everything right. Uh, this house is pretty much a total loss. Uh, we had fire in the attic. Um, these are sheets kind of covering up where the roofing was pulled back to, to let some of that smoke out. How did it get in there? The answer's on there. But the point is, there was debris in the gutters. That debris caught on fire, and sure enough, the flames got right inside the attic. You think you have everything right, but there's the fine details that matter. We also, in this particular situation, there's a lot of vegetation right next to that house. So was it worth putting time on? I don't know. There was firefighter response in this case. There were a number of homes that survived in this situation. They probably, it was probably a good idea to manage this one so it didn't spread additional radiant heat and other materials to the surrounding homes. Skylights. If you live in the Redwood country, you better have a skylight, right? I mean, how are you going to live in that dark, that dark environment? Uh, but you've got choices. You've got trade-offs. You've got uh, many potential issues. Here, uh, we can at least see a dome skylight. You can see that it sheds the uh, vegetation, though it doesn't have the same heat rating as 
this glass skylight and you'd want a tempered glass skylight. What do we do here? Lots and lots of maintenance, regular maintenance. Cannot escape the maintenance requirement here in this particular situation. Okay, vents. Why do we need vents? Okay, so reduce heat load. You may be able to manage that heat that gets it built up. Why else do we need vents? Moisture, right? So when we cook, what do we do? We put, we make spaghetti. We put tons and tons of moisture into our conditioned environment, and that moisture needs to get out someplace, right? Otherwise, it's very steamy inside your house, and bad things happen. It gets moldy over time. So vents are really important to let hot air out, to let moisture out, to let cool air in, and create circulation. Just in my mind, a lot like where the difference between wearing a rain, a classic rain jacket and a Gore-Tex rain jacket, right? We make heat on the inside, we make moisture on the inside, we want that to go out, but at the same time, we also want to keep the rain from coming in. And that's the way our ventilation system needs to work. The problem is that it's pretty easy to have penetration and have material come in and out, which you, which you don't want. So these under eave vents are important for that inlet, for that cool air to come in, the foundation vents are important to let the moisture out from underneath our house. The gable and vents allow circulation. The through roof vents allow an outlet. All, every house has a slightly different system, but this is the main point. You need airflow and circulation. But as I just explained a little earlier, they're vulnerable to penetration uh, from embers. And so what do you do about this? And the challenge is more complicated because the majority of us have homes that were built in an era where we used quarter inch mesh. Uh, and you know, it has some advantages, uh, one of which is when you are painting your house and you're spraying it, it's not gonna fill up with paint in the same way that the finer mesh will. So it's a little easier to maintain, but it's, we've now shown very definitively that it's really easy to penetrate with embers. So the standards are changing to a quarter inch uh, mesh screen size and smaller. Sorry, eighth, sorry, eighth inch screen size and smaller. Um, and it's possible to retrofit some existing vents on the cheap side to be able to, to handle that ember penetration. What it doesn't do though, when you just make, when you just add new screen size to it, is it doesn't resist flame, right? You can still have flame penetration. So there is a new effort um, to design and build vents that resist both flame and embers. And so I've got some images of, of those. I have one example. I'm not representing Vulcan vent here, uh, but it's just an illustration of what happens. So this is a foundation vent. It's got a finer mesh screen on it. It also has an intumescent layer in there that's honeycombed. Uh, in this case, when heat is exposed to that uh, aluminum, it melts and it seals up. And so then the vent basically stops airflow both in and out. Kind of cool, isn't that? There are other ways to achieve that same function. Um, in this case here, uh, so that was a foundation vent. In this case here and here, these are both gable and vents. This one is designed as a baffle design, uh, which resists both flame and embers. Um, I have a baffle design in my exhaust fan over my kitchen stove. So you may have seen one of those kind of baffle systems. Here in, um, sorry. Here's another kind of system. Um, these kinds of vents, the larger vents, run about $125 uh, an individual vent. Does that jive with what you guys are, are seeing? These foundation vents are in the $25, $30 range. Um, this is a through roof vent that's got uh, both a screen and a, um, and a baffle system um, of steel wool here to be able to manage both uh, the embers and flame. So there's new technologies out there that, are, that work, that are well tested, um, that are very effective. It may not be in your budget right now, uh, so you could take an interim step with using a metal mesh screen that's available and kind of upgrading your foundation vent, your gable and vents, things like that where you can staple them up and, and make a difference. Um, you also can, can develop some kind of uh, deployable 
shutters or ways to shut those vents down if you have enough time before you need to evacuate. Um, you know, there's a lot of ifs in, in that kind of situation, but there are other ways to seal up your vents uh, during kind of those critical periods. Okay, we had a question here. These, no, these all pass moisture. Yep. Chapter 7A is California's Wildland Urban Interface Construction Code. And that is the, the new rules in town. Uh, and um, at the office, the state office of the fire marshal, you can go through a website and look at different products and see what's listed within those, um, within a whole variety of categories. Um, I find the website a little overwhelming, um, but it is, it is possible and maybe your Fire Safe Council staff can kind of help you work through that. Um, I hope it'll, it'll get better soon, um, but, but they're, all, they're all listed and available there. So I think you asked a question earlier about ridgeline vents. Um, ridgeline vents are, are important uh, and are an interesting way to, to try and vent your home, uh, depending on the, the slope of your roof. Uh, you can get more or less accumulation uh, next to the, the roof itself. So in this image is showing some needle material that is, is near a skylight as well as the ridgeline vent. Um, and you can imagine that that material could also uh, be exposed to embers and then you might have fire right near your ridgeline system. So it's a maintenance issue. You, you need vents because you need to be able to manage that moisture and that heat. These are trade-offs, but maintenance makes a difference. So let's talk about windows and doors. Um, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in them. Um, depending on your particular situation, and that's what this decision tree tries to illustrate, if you can't manage the amount of fuel that's outside your window or door, windows become much more important. So if your outbuilding is close to it, your neighbor's house is close to your window, if you know, your detached garage is close to your window, then this is a great time to think about upgrading to a tempered glass uh, window. And that's because the temperature rating for, temperature gla for tempered glass is much more significant than for a standard annealed glass. So be aware of, of kind of the improvements you can get in, in fire resistance uh, with different types of windows. Uh, the dual pane is helpful because you, you have you know, one pane that's able to kind of manage that heat and you've got a secondary pane that's, that's inside of that. Um, there are a variety of issues in general and if you really can't manage this issue, you might think about deployable shutters, uh, non-combustible shutters that you could install for these, um, these critical fire weather conditions or evacuation. Uh, again, here's an illustration of kind of what those, what those window cracks might look like. Um, and uh, this came just from a potted plant right here. Okay, question. I have a question. The blinds inside yeah. look like they might be wood blinds. Whether we keep them shut to keep it cooler in the house or have those raised up, even if you have those same windows? What do you guys think? Do you like them raised up? Yep. Okay. Because they're combustible and mm -hmm. they're frozen. Heat, right, and so if you lose the first pane, crack glass. Crack glass. Uh, I tend to want to say open those curtains. All, all of that, that kind of, kind of stuff. Yep. Another illustration of vegetation fire. Clearly we had firefighter response here. You can see the remnants of, of the hose and the fire hydrant. Uh, this material wicked the fire right to the house through the window uh, into, into that front um, overhang and they were lucky. So what about decks? Anybody have a deck? Yep, love your deck. Yep, yep, love my deck too. Um, there is a bunch of new design systems for decks. There's new research to support it. There's a, there's a pamphlet on the back about decks. Uh, anyone thinking about upgrading their deck? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So make sure you walk away with kind of the new guidance on decks. Um, so a couple things, um, our decks tend to be kind of tight to each other, our board deck boards, and so you get lots of stuff that connect, that uh, fills and plugs the gaps, right? And that is combustible most of the time. 
So that's a point of maintenance and management. Uh, the other is issue is that deck joists can wick uh, the fire to your house. It can smolder from one deck board to the next along the deck joists. Um, so for those that might be working with redwood uh, or cedar, there's a, a new set of recommendations, which is to build 24 inches on center, so fewer deck joists in general, uh, using a quarter inch gap between the deck boards, and then using a foil face tape on the deck joists. Uh, all inexpensive items here, but the point is that it will prevent the smoldering and wicking from one deck board to the next. And you know, another idea is to use a non-combustible board that's right next to the house. Uh, make sure you manage that gap very well and keep it clean. But the most important part when it comes to decks is what do we store under them? We store everything under them, don't we? Is that a problem? Yeah, it's a problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just too convenient of a spot to put and tuck away all those items. This is a real problem. If it's not clear now, I hope, I hope it becomes clear by the, end of, by the end of our program here. All of this material can, in, can get embers in it. It can get direct flame contact there. Uh, maybe it could get radiant heat. And if you ignite the deck, then you have a burning structure attached to your house, and that is a problem. And it's not easy to pull that burning structure off, and it may not be defendable and may not be worth the time. So this is the, the kind of standard that we're trying to get to. Uh, additional to this is what, uh, what is the slope around the deck? Uh, is it the top of a chimney? Uh, meaning, is the fire going to come running up against the house and the deck extends over the slope? Bet you have a beautiful view. All of that stuff matters, so depending on the level of risk and exposure, the standard for that deck might need to be improved and increased. Fences. Fences are great, right? Fences make great neighbors, right? But fences also have their own set of issues. Um, when we start a, uh, a fire in an outside setting, uh, what do you start with, or in your wood stove? You start with kindling. Now, why do we start with kindling? Because it burns more easily. And why does it burn more easily? Because it's, it's smaller. So when you look at this lattice structure here, is it thicker or smaller? Great it's great kindling, right? And it easily can have grass that can connect to it, and you can easily have a fence on fire that can bring fire to your house. Fences make great neighbors. Fences are important. So how do we manage this issue? Vinyl burns. Metal, metal doesn't burn. Here's an illustration from uh, Coffee Park. Uh, this is a photo that was taken by the Mill Valley Fire Chief who lost his home in Coffee Park. Fences were a big challenge in Coffee Park. There was lots of challenges in Coffee Park. The houses uh, were 10 feet separation from each other, drip line to drip line, five feet. Lots of radiant heat exposures, lots of challenges, but Coming back to fences, I'm totally for wood fences, but you can make a difference by it making sure it doesn't attach to the house. Thinking of it in that same non-combustible zone where you maybe in, instead have a metal attachment point, have a metal gate or some other way to separate the fence from the house itself so you don't have fire wicked directly to your house. Seem reasonable? Siding where most people want to start, because it's what you can see. Feel the best when you paint your house, right? When it's all fresh and new looking. But let's talk about what some of the issues are with siding. Um, we've hosted programs for years and could get very few people to show up, three, four. We, these programs are kind of cool. We'd actually do these little demonstration burns out in the parking lot uh, and be able to show siding because it was just it was something easy and manageable. Here in this illustration, uh, this, this side of this uh, corner has a uh, intumescent uh, coating on it. It's designed to resist fire. This side does not. There's a brand here, and uh, the brand is ignited, and then uh, we watch it and see what happens. So the coating makes a difference, and then we've got full, full exposure on this side. What does that look like on the other side? 
That's what I want to show you. So when you look on the other side, you can see that the flames are penetrating in each of those gaps, each of those laps, each of those joints and connectors. So what that means is that managing lots of edges and lots of gaps is a more challenging situation. So if you have paneling, paneling actually does a lot better in general. Uh, four by eight sheets, not a lot of gaps and joints, right? Less to manage. So thinking about what kind of exposure your, your siding may uh, experience uh, and what type of siding you have you know, is, is, is perhaps part of your decision making process. By creating both that horizontal non-combustible zone, you can create quite a bit of uh, reduced exposure to your siding and kind of manage the issue. Secondarily, or in additionally, if you also give it a little clearance from the ground, so a vertical zone, that also makes a difference. Why do we need to plant right up to the edge of our siding, touching our house? I don't know why, but we tend to do this, don't we? I mean, you'll see this all the time. So here's what we're trying to get to, is a little more for horizontal and vertical separation. That will make a difference and kind of manage this issue of having too many gaps and joints. Okay. I'm talking about any, it, I'm talking about any kind of siding, right? Because once you've got, um, once you've got heat, then you start to get deformation and you start to get flexing, and then you can get penetration. I mean, I have hardy plank siding on that cabin, and that stuff moves around all over the place. The heat load that it takes, it's warping and distorting, right? Those boards do not want to sit in place. My wood wants to, is actually, will sit and test it. Yep. 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 Okay. 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 So stucco is is uh, more fire resistant than than a wood siding product. That's correct. But I can I can show you picture after picture of stucco homes with metal roofs in Santa Rosa that burn. Right, the siding is not the main driver in the equation. The, the embers may be penetrated through the, through the vents, there was some weakness in the roof, any number of potential scenarios play out. There also can be weakness in, um, depending how uh, your stucco is constructed, you could have a little, um, a lot of times you'll see stucco go straight to the ground and then you'll have a, a cement sidewalk next to it. But there's a gap at the bottom, a little weep zone, and there is uh, part of the assembly layer will leave a um, piece of combustible material that sticks out at the bottom. And so then you can get embers that blow up against the edge of the house and then there can be you know, vegetation that's stuck underneath in that little gap and then you can get right behind the siding. So you have to understand sort of the assembly of, of how your stucco is constructed. Uh, whether it's true stucco, what it is. Um, what I'm trying to point out is all these little details matter and there are things you can do about them and to be aware of what they are so that you can manage them. And then again, just to sort of reiterate and look at where all those weak points are and where all that fuel is, right? So the broom, uh, the firewood, uh, maybe the garage door, how well does your garage door seal? your cat door, your dog door. There's lots of little places, little nooks and crannies. So my pattern and behavior, uh, I have a cabin that needs to defend itself on its own. And I like to store a broom on the front porch and firewood on the front porch during the winter time. During the fire season, is that stuff there? Nope, not at all. Is today a day of critical fire weather? Absolutely. So being aware of where your fuel is today makes a big difference. Right? You may only have a few minutes. You may not have time to throw your, veg throw your deck furniture off and do all that kind of stuff. So if you start to get into a pattern of behavior when you recognize those signs of nature that say, it's super dry, we've got winds coming offshore, you know, we have this situation that could stack up that could really be at risk. Understanding what a red flag warning is, thinking about how to respond to that, talking about it as a family so that you're not freaking your kids out or your grandkids out, so that we just know, okay, all right, this is what we got to do today. This is this is the way, the way we 
way we roll when this happens. And also helping our neighbors, right? Our neighbors to evacuate, our neighbors to, to make sure that they're managing their issues. If they're someone of special needs, if they're in lesser abilities, right? We all have to work on this together because if your neighbor is really close to you, physically close to you, their condition may affect your survival, your home survival. So we all have to work together on this. But these are things that we can manage. So let's look um, at this sheet a little bit more um, and, and begin to think about this sheet. So what I want to illustrate here, priority number one, the basics, the roof, the vents, and the adjacent fuel. So at the end of the session, we're going to start to go through each of those, and I want you to think about what condition are your roof, vents, and adjacent fuel. If they're all in good shape, then you can go on to the next scenario. Uh, and this is broken up to, in, the next priority really is broken up into two scenarios here. That your neighbor's house is less than 25 feet away or your neighbor's house is greater than 25 feet away. The priorities change depending on that type of uh, situation. And then there are the fine points, the other details, the refinement that comes on after you're able to manage those issues. Okay, as I wrap up here, so let's just remember that it's about the roof, the vents, and this new term, the non-combustible zone, that are really the critical priorities, things that you can manage today. Uh, you can go to the California Building Code, Chapter 7A, to be able to find the kinds of materials, to, you know, materials list. Um, it's sorted by, I think, brand name, but I think it's sorted by, it's a little, a little unusual that way. Um, but I really want to illustrate that n there is no silver bullet out there. There's no one product that you can buy that's going to do it for you. It's really about thinking about all the little details, how they all work together in your situation. And poor maintenance, poor construction with the right materials is just as much of a problem, right? If you don't know what the assembly standard is and it's installed incorrectly, then it's not going to perform to the ability that it's designed to. So there's a million people out there that are ready to sell you something and tell you that this is going to solve your problem. In most cases, it's not one solution here. And then coming back to this idea about what does our fire safe landscape look like? I'm a firm believer in beauty. I'm a firm believer in safety and in privacy and being able to find the way to plant in and around our homes in a way that makes sense. It might mean a little less density near the house, might mean some separation from the house, but these are things we can manage. Okay, so work from the house out. Rethink about how you address this issue by reprioritizing what's right next to your house and working towards your neighbor's house. Meet them on the other side. Figure out what you guys can do together. So let's look at a couple of uh, examples from homes that have survived. Here's one from the car fire in Reading. I was giving a presentation um, about this year last time, and uh, a gentleman walked up to me and he said, um, I'm really fortunate that my home survived. The 17 homes surrounding my home did not. I'm not sure why, but listening to the kinds of things you're talking about makes me think that Maybe I did some of the right stuff. So I got the opportunity to go visit his house. Uh, this is um, a home that took a lot of exposure. There were lots of examples of how much embers um, were brought onto that house. Uh, it, the, it did burn in and around his house, uh, most definitely. But look at the way he practiced his house. Uh, he used non-combustible uh, gravel here. Um, this is granite. Uh, to be able to create walkways, he used cement in, in proper placement. Uh, in some cases, the, the cement walkway was not very wide, but it was sufficient to provide uh, a little separation and protection. He did have some wood, uh, wood windows, as well as some wood doors that did just fine. Uh, he did have landscaping, but it wasn't underneath his eaves. Uh, there was separation there. 
Uh, this is aloe, so it, it didn't have uh, as much likelihood to burn. Um, and he's fortunate to, to be able to have a house to come back to. Here's paradise. Uh, this is one house in a sea in probably a mile in every direction where there's not a single survivor. Um, this house is older in construction, but it was for sale. Why does that make a difference? Because why? Fixed up. Fixed up. Why else? Cleaned up. There's no junk. There's no stuff around it. There's no play structures. There's no newspapers. It's spick and span. It also had a number of upgrades. So uh, they kicked in for a remodel. So they kicked into the new construction standards. Uh, this is a Vulcan vent in a foundation setting. You can see this doormat, um, and you can see all the burn marks, so you know it got a lot of ember exposure. But there's other elements. So there, again, is this non-combustible zone in and around the house. Also, a really tall foundation here. So there's both vertical and horizontal se separation from the surrounding area. The, uh, there's a new roof, new metal gutters, no gutter guards under a pine uh, forest. Gutters definitely were filled with pine needles. Uh, the gutters had signs of uh, burning in every one of them. It was a metal drip edge. The fire extinguished itself and didn't cause uh, exposure to the roof. This is in contrast to the um, detached garage, which was, had much less, much less effort put into it. Uh, did have a new roof, um, and it did not have new windows, and the windows were broken. Radiant heat exposure. Why did the garage survive? It's clean. There was nothing in the garage. When the windows broke, the single pane windows broke, there was nothing to catch on fire. Right? Very lucky. So how do we put it all together? I've been looking for, um, I'm looking for great images. If you guys want to make some great examples here, I'd love to be able to brag about what you've got going. So I challenge you to do that. I found a house recently, uh, as of this last winter, that was under construction that uh, is in the Mount Shasta area. And it seems to have all the right parts for me. Um, it, is, it's got, uh, it is in a neighborhood. Homes are fairly widely spaced from each other. There are pine trees all around it. But they're managing uh, both their fuel separation and creating a non-combustible zone. They're meeting all the new construction standards. But they're giving their house separation so that it's less likely to have exposure, both from embers as well as from, from direct flame contact. There was a fire not too far from here in the last decade. So you know, they're probably quite aware of, of these issues. I'm guessing that the landscape in here, but it's not going to have a direct contact like that other image from, from the car fire. So it'll be interesting to see how this house evolves. Uh, but trying to suggest what, what this new design aesthetic looks like, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with, but I think it's all possible. So in conclusion, why do we have a firefighting force? Why do we think we can fight every fire in a fire-adapted landscape? We don't have a tornado fighting force, or a hurricane fighting force, or an earthquake fighting force, do we? No, what do we do? We adapt, we build smarter, we learn, we evolve. But we've got this sort of false set of expectations just by the name of our fire force and our fire professionals that they're going to be able to manage every incident for us. It's not true. They are heroic people that put themselves in harm's way every day for us. And what are we doing to help in that equation? What can you do? Is it worth it? Yes. Trying to build smarter. Trying to adapt means thinking about embers in a way that we haven't thought about them before. And these are things that we can manage. These are things that we can do. I'm excited to see the data from Paradise. I'm excited to see that the new construction standards really are, appear to be making a difference. 
I'm excited that AB 38 passed this year, which is going to hopefully free up some funds to help incentivize upgrades to existing homes. There's also exciting stuff happening here in your community, which you're going to hear about in a minute, ways to try and help uh, underwrite some of the costs and give you appropriate information. So that's really great. And I hope, as a community, you start to adapt to this idea about a non-combustible zone or an ember-resistant zone, uh, because I do fundamentally believe that it'll make a difference in urban and rural settings. So when we start to think about what is that resilient landscape and what is it that we need to manage, the answer is all of it. Right? It's not just construction standards that need to change. It's not just the alert system that needs to change. It's not just land use planning. It's all these pieces. There's room for improvement across the system. I'm pleased that we've got more of an audience to think about new construction and resilient homes. But we also have to put it in context with all the other pieces that we have room for improvement on. This is not to overwhelm you. It's meant to say there are lots of things that we can do in our personal and professional lives that can make a difference. So I'm excited to see what you're going to do in this community because you're going to do great things. All right, let's try another one. How do you feel about this house? You, you want to get rid of the lattice here, OK. The roof looks like a disaster, OK. Uh, so it's got a lot of material that could fall down on that roof, doesn't it? Yep. We don't know it. We you know we don't know anything about this house, right? It's just an image of someone's house here. What are other risks that this house might face? The trees are too close. Those trees are kind of close, but they might help for shade, right? There's going to be some tension. I don't know if they're in the city limits or not, and whether they're subject to that ordinance. <laughs> I bet the house has a great view. But I, I'm not, so again, I'm not worried about the trees. I'm worried about the structure itself. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so I, I, I was going to focus solely on the house at this point. Yep. Keeping the roof, the gutters off too. Uh, the trees are manageable. The house is uh, a fire risk. Mm -hmm. Trees look much, they look like they're laying down for the roof. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is called epicormic sprouting. This is what happens when you get heat load on the edge of a, of a sprouting species. This is, is illustrative of, of that. That kind of situation is perfectly normal. We don't know whether there is a non-combustible zone around here. It looks like there might be or maybe there isn't, but we could maybe expand that. When we've got a slope, we might have, want to have more uh, separation of fuels so you don't have that fuel continuity. Um, this deck does um, make me pause for a moment. Uh, you might want to replace the deck surface here with a non-combustible one. Uh, really want to manage the fuels and the material underneath the deck. Number of things could happen here. So that's probably some kind of cover to keep uh, leaf and dirt off of some kind of cushion, some kind of outdoor furniture. If it's a time of evacuation, what are we going to do with that? We're going to get rid of it. We're either going to bring it inside and put it in a safe, secure place, or we're going to throw it far away from the house. We're going to get it off the deck. They may be old single pane, definitely. So some things to think about. We don't know. It's not our house, right? Lattice, OK. All right, how about this house? <laughs> so I'm sure it's paradise here. There's something going on here. There's definitely litter accumulation here. We've got. Uh, contact direct from the garden to the house. I'm going to fess up that I know the person whose house it is, and they're in this room. And they've got a creative idea. They want to move the house. Uh huh. Hey, it's creative solutions here, <clears throat> right? I made the comment in the earlier session that I didn't like the the uh, the lean on that tree. Um, so. There's some things to think about. If you're going to leave that tree, then you know you're setting yourself up for a maintenance issue, right? And those, why do we have gutters, by the way? Can we talk about that? Why are gutters important? So the water doesn't come down, A, get you wet if you walk underneath it, B, so it doesn't hit the side of the house and rot the siding out, right? So gutters are important, but they also become this place for collection. So 
gutter guards uh, may be a, a good solution in this situation. Maintenance is going to be important. None of the gutter guards have been tested, just so you know. So we don't know how one performs against another. So I would say if you're going to put gutter guards on, make sure they're non-combustible, so they're a material that won't burn. But this is a maintenance issue. If you can commit to managing that maintenance issue, then you can manage it. The challenge is the wind conditions that tend to create these ember-driven fires also tend to move a lot of material in that time period. So you might have been managing those issues until you can't manage them when all this material comes down. So like the Tubbs fire happened right in the middle of leaf drop, for example. So a lot of material came down that night. I know in my house, my entire deck was covered in redwood needles when it had not been the previous day. So we all manage risk differently. How about here? Pretty urban setting. Shrubs are very close to the house. Yep, they're in front of the windows here. Mulch by the house. Again, stucco construction, that's maybe helpful, but all this here could be flopped, could be pulled out a little flip-flopped with the walkways coming a little wider, for example. There are things that could be done here. We don't know the condition of the vents. Uh, those could be upgraded. We've got a complex roof here. Uh, we've got wall now having to be exposed to potential you know, conditions up here, so we might want to upgrade that wall. Number of items. Yeah. Probably is better rated. Can you answer that question, Rob? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. It's less combustible. It's less combustible in general, but we still need to manage, manage what that situation looks like, maintain it, think about any weaknesses overall. How about here? Check those gutters. Yep. I'm going to promote that. I'm going to promote that that redwood needs to go. It's not going to get any smaller, is it? <laughs> Placement makes a difference. Redwoods are not meant to be next to houses, in general. You're right. That does look like there's some issue going on here. More, more to find out. We don't know what's going on there. How about here? Shrubs. Yep. 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 Complex. Well, yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of planes that are coming in here. Got a fence line. We don't know whether that fence attaches to the house. Yep. How about here? You want to give this an A plus? <coughs> Shrubs by the house. This. Side. Right. This used to be my demonstration photo for defensible space. I don't feel that way anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of work that could be done here. I like what's going on out here, but I want some more work over there. Can they achieve that? Yeah. Yeah. A little sweat equity, you could do that. Yeah. How about here? Yeah. Nice place to sit, though, right? That guy kind of bothers me over here. Maybe these pots bother me, depending on what, what, they're, what they have in them. There are things that could be done in weather like today and an evacuation. There's a lot of things that are right here. We've got a lot of gravel here. More, more, we need more <coughs> images here to be able to understand this. How about here? Beautiful house. Beautiful house, right? <clears throat> what do you want to do here? Mm -hmm. You guys get why propane barbecues are a problem? They're fuel, right? <laughs> Boom, right. Yeah, so the idea is that you know, when you're evacuating, you want to move those propane tanks as far away from your house as you can. You want to shut them off and move them. Okay. Here? Right here? I don't know the, the appropriate answer empirically. I can tell you from a maintenance perspective that I kind of want to just keep it and manage it and clear it out because I know I can get under there. 
depending how well you seal it, you've got some moisture challenges to deal with and you still may have some type of growth under there that you might not be able to get to anymore. Okay, we're almost to the conclusion here. So these are images from paradise. These are surviving homes. I'm gonna assume that there was some level of firefighter response or else we wouldn't have a surviving home here. And the question we're gonna ask over the next three or four slides is what happened? Combustibles in the garbage cans. So we got some nice melted garbage cans over here. The garbage can is combustible, yes. What else happened here? How did we get fire to that house? I don't think that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Well, I think my thought here is that we had is that we had a fence. We had a fence, we've just got a little bit of it left. And then the garbage cans, the garbage cans were close to the house. The fence brought the fire and embers to the garbage cans and to the house. And then we had direct exposure, direct flame contact on the house. And uh, it got into the siding and into the underneath of the roof there. I don't know, I'm making it up. But you still can see how easy that can happen, right? So we could have had a non-combustible zone entirely around that house, uh, had some separation from the fence. Um, you know, Paradise didn't get a lot of warning, right? So moving combustible materials is not something that most people had time to do. But it illustrates kind of how our practice might need to change if we're in a place that has high risk of fire. A question. Yeah? So if you have a wooden fence with a wooden gate, the wooden gate attaches to the house, could you open the gate and create that opportunity? Most certainly that's the easiest thing to do. It depends on what it you know, attaches to on the other side and whether that's, that's a fine material that's capable of being ignited. But yeah, I don't, I don't see why that wouldn't be a first step. And as over time you might change that, but you should put that in your plan, right? I'm gonna do this, because you're not gonna remember everything when you go to evacuate, trust me. Okay, what about here? What is that? Do you not recognize vinyl siding? <laughs> that's, that's what happens to vinyl fencing, too. So what happened in this situation? We had a lot of heat, right? That's what led to the deformation and the, and the warping and the melting of the vinyl siding. What about here? What's going on here? Why is it black? Why is it black? Leaf litter. That litter probably ignited and we had a fire on top of the roof. You can see there was one in the gutters right there. Maybe one over here too. Had a lot more accumulated stuff around this house, right? What's this? This was a fence. <laughs> right? Looks like a vine <laughs> would have tried and melted the wall. I don't know. These are these are in the collection of, of images from from Cal Fire from Paradise. So I don't know, but I think they're illustrative of interesting points nonetheless. <laughs> Don't know. How about if people had been forced to stay in most of these houses that we've been seeing, would they have survived? So that's a great question. So I'm going to answer it from my perspective. You were in paradise, and then I, I want you to answer it afterwards. You don't want to get trapped outside. You don't want to get trapped in your car. <laughs> these are difficult decisions when you have very little time. You're likely to be safer in your house if the flaming front is coming at you until the flaming front passes. But then you need to get out of your house and you need to have a way to get out of your house. So if you can't get in and get out, then you certainly don't have a house that you wanna shelter in. There may be a neighbor's house that's in much better condition and that should be part of your plan. But the last thing you wanna do is evacuate late 
and get burned over in your car or burned over on foot. These are difficult choices. So what am I missing from that conversation? I think you pretty much hit it. You know, um, getting out early, listening to the radio, the news, um, when they talk about voluntary evacuations, that's when you need to run. Say it's mandatory. That means it's you know fire's getting close, really late, and you're probably going to create problems for yourself, other people trying to evacuate, and then responders trying to come in and um, you know fight the fire. So I think the best message is just get out, get out early. So here was a great story from Paradise. I met a woman um, who's was trying to manage her kids in school. Uh, her neighbor took. One of her kids, she took the other neighbor's kid. They went to two different schools because they had two school drop-offs. And she, as soon as she dropped off her high school era ki age kids, we got the phone call. Hey, Mom, I think there's something going on. I think uh, you need to come pick me up. And the first thought was, who pulled my leg? <laughs> of course, you don't want to be in school. Like, what's going on here? Then a few minutes go by. She starts to hear some news and realizes, OK, this is a real issue. And so she and her neighbor go and retrieve their kids. She comes back to her house. She's on the west side. Her plan is to work on her five-hour plan. She's going to start putting stuff together. She's going to be rational. She's going to be calm. But what she found interesting was the moment when she went to get her kids, the dog would not leave her side. The dog knew something was going on, and the dog wanted to go with her. And the dog continued to behave very strangely. So she's starting to put her five-hour plan. She's putting a few things together. She walks outside. And she sees all the birds migrating. She goes, all right, it's not the five-hour plan anymore. It's a five-minute plan. They grabbed the bare minimum, including the turtle, and they left. There are signs and signals that you need to pay attention to. They may or not be someone coming down the road reminding you what to do. You need to make wise decisions and work on all your resources that you have including what nature's telling you, you need to be prepared.